you may or may not be familiar with solar graphy. So bear with me and I'll start with a short explanation. You might know long exposure photos, images where the shutter was left open for minutes and sometimes even hours and everything that moves becomes blurry and ghostly. But you might or might not know solar graphy images. For that you just need to ditch your digital camera, slide a piece of light sensitive photo paper in a box with a pinhole and put that somewhere in the sun. These makeshift cameras take long exposures for days or months, often exactly half a year. These solar graphies are pretty special. The sun permanently marks the paper while it moves over the horizon, day for day for day. Some days are cloudy and no sun is visible. Other days have clear skies and the sun scorches the paper. That's pretty cool, but can we do that digitally, like with a digital camera? Spoiler, yes, we can. But first I'll talk really long about boring theory. When you are doing a long exposure on film, you are just capturing all the photons hitting your film. The longer the shutter stays open, the more photons you get, in theory. Thanks to this fine gentleman, Karl Schwarzschild, we know it's not that easy. When the film emulsion reacts under the light exposure, it gets less sensitive and we need to extend the exposure time to compensate for that. Luckily, that's not the case when using a digital sensor. So the sensor just heats up and your whole exposure is completely crap anyway. So how can we do really long exposures with a digital sensor? Imagine you want to capture the movement of a ball. Sorry, that's the simplest example I could come up with. So you have something that moves from A to B. You do a long exposure and capture all the photons bouncing off the ball at infinite positions along the line. But what if we use burst mode and take three very short exposures instead and overlay them in a single photo? We get three distinct positions of the ball in a single image from these. If we increase our sample rate, we get closer and closer to the long exposure. Let's do that for a real scene. We are taking a photo every minute here and then merge all of them into a single image. Every single of the short captures is correctly exposed for the moment it was taken in and every short exposure contributes the same amount to the whole image. I think you will see the issue right away. It looks awful. So what's the problem? There is a different amount of light hitting the camera at different times. When we capture a long exposure, we measure at the start and guess if the light might change. Usually that's okay because the time is limited. But when looking at a full day, the amount of light hitting the camera changes substantially from start to finish and we can't predict that in any way. We can see that the early hours of the day would contribute much to the overall picture, but the really bright midday sun and afternoon really pushes the exposure. So we need a way of measuring, or at least estimating, how much light in absolute terms hits the sensor. How can we do that? For the short exposures, the camera is in auto mode, setting shutter speed, aperture and ISO to adapt to the scene brightness. These settings are controlled by the camera's built-in light meter. So can we use this as brightness measurements? It would be good to know if much more or much less light hits the sensor right now compared to maybe an hour or a minute ago. Luckily, there's a nice metric for that, and that's the exposure value. The exposure value is defined as a logarithm to the base of 2 of luminance multiplied by sensor gain divided by a light meter calibration constant. That sounds kind of complicated, but be with me. We don't need physically and absolute correct values. Since we only compare our exposures relative to each other and each one is measured with the camera's own light meter, calibration is irrelevant. So we can get rid of that. Apply the logarithm rules, rename S to sensor gain for readability, replace luminance by aperture and shutter speed, and we're almost done. Flip a few signs for convenience, and we got a slightly easier measure of exposure value. Exposure value is a combination of these three values. If we double or half the amount of light hitting the camera, the EV value changes by one. In combination with the camera's built-in light meter, we can misuse this to measure scene brightness. So when computing our long exposure from the single images, we just have to adjust the sensor data from each image using the exposure value. How does it look? Ah, way closer to the analog exposures. 
Now every pixel in each image is not only defined by its own brightness, but also by the general brightness of the scene at the moment of capture. Technically, that's a pixel-wise weighted average over all exposures, using the exponent with the exposure value as a weighting factor. Just as a side note, in case you're wondering, we are using logarithms and exponents here because that's how the human vision apparatus works, but that's a different story. But back to the image. There is still something missing. See the sun? It's completely gone on the long exposure image. Let's talk for a moment about dynamic range. Every sensor, and every film of course, has a range of brightnesses it can capture. Everything too dark is completely black, everything too bright is completely white. Usually people say that's about 12 stops or 12 EV. So when some part of the image would be correctly exposed, and a different part gets 64 times as much light, or 2 to the power of 6, it would be almost completely white. So far, pretty straightforward. For computed long exposures, that's not really a problem when dealing with areas of the image that are too dark, because that's how film behaves as well. But for bright things, that's a massive problem. When doing a true long exposure, we are only letting a tiny fraction of the total amount of light hit the light-sensitive medium. But if there's an extremely bright object, such as the sun, it just dumps a, such a crazy amount of light compared to everything else, on a tiny spot of the camera, that even when this happens only for a short time compared to the total exposure time, it maxes out the light-sensitive medium. That's the concept behind light painting and these photos of car headlights on highways. So with a true long exposure, we can capture these short local brightness peaks and our true dynamic range is much higher in the special case. There is this fancy technique of high dynamic range imaging. Now you probably think about peculiar images which have been very en vogue for a few horrible years. No, don't despair, that's not what we're doing here. But we need to somehow capture this information about where the image would have been so strongly exposed that the film would be burned. There is only one way to do that, and that's to reduce the amount of light hitting the sensor. If you can remove as much light as necessary, only the dangerously bright parts would remain. But can a regular camera do that? Here comes a neutral density filter. Every camera can capture a fixed window of EVs depending on its shutter speed, ISO settings and aperture limits of the lens. By using a really strong ND filter, we can shift the window of EVs we are able to expose. We need to be able to capture the sun at about 26 EVs on a sunny day and dusk and dawn at about 5 or 6 EVs. Either a 6 or a 10 stop ND filter works best for this. So what do we do now? We capture a single, correctly exposed image every minute and a second image at a predefined, very low exposure level that would be completely black except for the bright pixels. How does it look? Perfect. The only problem that remains is, how do I capture a correctly exposed image and an image as underexposed as possible in intervals for a day or longer? Let's talk about hardware. I tried to make it work with my Sony camera and a bit of additional hardware, but that's simply a dead end. The problem is I can't control the camera with software in manual mode, but Sony is blocking light meter readings. The data is there, it's even shown in the display, but the camera software returns a zero value for the correct request. Thanks unknown Sony programmer, that fucks it up. Okay, plan B. What, what if I just build my own camera, kind of? Is that a stupid idea? Probably. Let's do it anyway. There are not a lot of options for decent sensors. I'm using a Raspberry Pi Zero, that's a tiny Linux board, and a Raspberry Pi camera module with 12 megapixels. That's pretty decent for what I want to do. 
I made an additional control board so I can automatically switch the computer off in between captures. Otherwise, I wouldn't even get half a day of runtime. Additionally, that thing takes care of monitoring the temperature. That's really something that can go horribly wrong. The weatherproof enclosure is 3D printed and holds the ND filter. So, let's put the thing together. So, I just put that in my unsuspicious little enclosure with enough battery to run for two days and drop it. After a few days I show up again, preferably with not too many people watching, and collect the sun-ripened fruits of my labor. I run the images through my stacking software that takes care of aligning, weighting, averaging, and we're done. So, let's have a look at the results. Nice. Was it worth it? Well, you tell me. A few remarks before I finish this video. Using a DIY camera is really a pain, but it has a few advantages. It's way smaller and I put it more or less wherever I want to take a picture for a few days. Because that's the nasty problem. I've got this fancy way of taking long exposures and so on, but what is it really worth it if I can only take pictures from a balcony? I actually want to go out there and use it wherever I want, not wherever I can put a tripod and a giant box with a large camera. That's why all of this works out really well. The DIY camera is relatively cheap, it's small and it doesn't look too suspicious. I don't actually want to get someone to panic and call the bomb squad or some over-eager public servant collecting the weird trash. But after all, the single and one most important thing to keep in mind is to put it out of reach. People ignore most stuff that is happening above their heads, but if something is somewhere where they can actually touch it or grab it, it's game over. If you want to know all the nasty technical details or want to build your own, have a look in the description. Source code and hardware is on GitHub and you'll find a blog post with a bit more info. If you've built something similar or something based on this, let me know. I'm always very happy to hear about that.